This morning's lesson is entitled Surviving the Worst Case Scenario. There's this term that is used in modern society to describe a combination of circumstances that would produce a very negative situation. You hear that in movies, news, the worst case scenario. It seems that people in every area of life, whether it be business or military, education, just plain family situations, use this phrase when considering various options that they may have to choose from. For example, worst case scenario for the United States at the moment, you hear it all the time, perhaps somebody coming into the country with a dirty bomb you know, in their suitcase, nuclear weapons, portable, uh, being left at uh, key uh, places uh, where people meet. Um, attacks against our energy network, uh, uh, taking down our online capabilities from, for the military or our, or our, uh, our energy uh, delivery systems, all, all kinds of threats. Uh, let's face it, if any one or a combination of these things happen, it would create terrible consequences to our, our nation's morale and economy and could easily be called the worst case scenario. Now it's very easy to think and fret about the worst things that could happen to us in every area of life. And the hard part is to come up with a way that we would react if such a scenario could, uh, would come true. How to survive the worst. You, know, you can't prevent it sometimes. How do you survive the worst case scenario? And so this morning I want us to look at a, at a man who faced the absolute worst case scenario for his life and the life of his nation and what he did to survive. And so while I'm making some comments here, I'd like you to take your Bibles out and open them to 2 Kings chapter 18. I'll be putting the scriptures up on the screen, but some folks like to read them out of their own Bible. So 2 Kings chapter 18. You know, in these shaky times, we all need a reminder that even when we're faced with the worst possible situation, God will not allow us to be tempted, tempted or tested. You could also put the word tested in there. God will not allow us to be tested beyond our endurance. And He always does provide a way out, a way to respond to the worst case scenario. So let's start our story here by giving you a little bit of background information about the individual who faced the worst case scenario. In the seventh century before Christ, the Jewish nation was divided, like the map that you see up on the screen. The northern part of the country was called Israel and it was ruled by a succession of wicked kings who practiced idolatry and all forms of wickedness and immorality contrary to the teachings that they had received from God and their leaders. And God punished them by allowing foreign nations to invade them and to conquer them. Now one of these nations, Assyria, eventually destroyed the capital of the northern kingdom, Samaria, and carried off nearly 30,000 people into exile. And if you're wondering about Syria, you, know, you see that little yellow blotch there in the picture? That little yellow blotch there, that was, that was Judah, the southern kingdom. And that green that you see there, that was Assyria. If you're wondering how, you know, what the odds were, how big one nation was and how tiny the other one was, this is the area that Assyria covered from different periods in history. Now the Assyrians, purposefully resettled the Jews from the north and forced them to intermarry with other people in order to pacify this very nationalistic country. In other words, they were watering down the bloodline. They understood, they understood how to you know, keep in check a very nationalistic tribe of people, just water down their bloodline, and that's what they did. They just spread them out over many, many different countries and force them to marry and intermarry with other nations. Many years later, this mixed race returned to the northern part of the country, no longer called Israel, but called Samaria. But they were forever alienated from their Jewish brothers 
in the south and that's because they were no longer a pure race. They had been mixed with pagan nations. Now the southern kingdom was called Judah and its capital was Jerusalem and it too had a history of idolatry and wickedness but had been saved from total destruction because several of its kings had made an effort to obey God. And so this lesson today is about one of those kings. And here is his story, as I say, in 2 Kings chapter 18. Now, from 735 to 715 BC, one of the worst rulers in the southern kingdom was on the throne. His name was Ahaz. He practiced human sacrifice. He, remember, this is a, this is a, a Jewish king now. This is not some pagan king, this is a Jewish king. He practiced human sacrifice. He worshiped idols. He set up altars to pagan gods in the hills surrounding Jerusalem. He sold the treasures of the temple in order to form political alliances with pagan nations, contrary to strict laws that God had given and forbade uh, kings to do that. He became indebted to the Assyrian king and as a form of homage, removed the Star of David from the temple in Jerusalem and replaced it with a pagan altar in order to placate the Assyrian king. In 715, his son Hezekiah replaced him as the king. Now of all the kings to sit on the throne, Hezekiah surely faced the worst case scenario of any ruler before him. If you're wondering where's the tie-in, there it is right there. Hezekiah faced the worst case scenario. Think about it now. His father had left the nation dead broke, no money. The temple, which was the central place of Jewish life and worship, had been desecrated by pagan intrusion. The people were involved in idolatry, a sin that the neighboring country, Israel, had been severely punished for by having their nation totally ruined and the population carried off into exile, and they were doing the same thing. In addition to this, the same nation that had destroyed Israel was now threatening the kingdom of Judah as well. In 701 BC, Sennacherib, who was the king of Assyria, surrounded Jerusalem with a fierce Assyrian army and demanded a complete and unconditional surrender of Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem. Now in 2 Kings chapter 18 and 19, the writer describes how the king of Assyria sent one of his messengers to negotiate the surrender with Hezekiah. And he describes how the messenger taunted the king and the people by challenging not only their army, but challenging their faith in God. In other words, he ridiculed them for having faith in their God. And he tells of how the Assyrian described the damage and the terror that they would put upon the Jews if they did not surrender. So here we pick up the story in chapter 18 of 2 Kings, beginning in verse 17. It says, let me give you there. Then the king of Assyria sent Tartan and Rabsaris and Rabshakeh from Lashish to King Hezekiah with a large army to Jerusalem. So they went up and came up to Jerusalem and when they went up they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool which is on the highway of the fuller's field. When they called to the king Eliakim the son of Hilkiah who was over the household, and Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came out to meet them. Then Rabshakeh said to them, Say unto Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, What is this confidence that you have? You say, but they are only empty words, I have counsel and strength for the war. Now on whom do you rely that you have rebelled against me? Now behold, you rely on the staff of this crushed reed, even on Egypt, on which if a man leans, it'll go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all those who rely on him. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, 
Is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away and has said to Judah, uh, uh, go to Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Now therefore come, make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give you 2,000 horses if you are able on your part to put riders on them. How then can you repulse one official of the least of my master's servants and rely on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? Have I now come up without the Lord's approval against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. And so we also read the prayer that Hezekiah made that night when he faced the worst case scenario. And what's the worst case scenario? Think about it for a second. He had no money to make a deal with. He had no army to defend the people. He had no allies who would come to his defense. You know, when, uh, the, uh, when the messenger talks about Egypt, you know, he says, if you rely on Egypt, it's like putting your hand on a, on a sharp stick, it'll cut, meaning Egypt's not going to help you. So they had no allies. They had no right. That's an important one. I mean, they had no right to ask for help from God because they had disobeyed God in the past. And they had no hope to think that they would not end up, like the Samaritans, destroyed and dispersed forever. I mean, even his advisors and friends wrote to the king, Hezekiah, encouraging him to give up. But Hezekiah prayed to God in the presence of this worst case scenario. And his, prayers, his prayer rather is in uh, uh, 2 Kings chapter 19, beginning in verse 14. It says, Then Hezekiah took the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it, and he went up to the house of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, the God of Israel, who are enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone, uh, uh, pull, kingdom, uh, pull the kingdoms uh, of the earth. You have made heaven and, uh, and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see, and listen to the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have devastated the nations in their lands and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone, so they have destroyed them. Now, O Lord our God, I pray, deliver us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, O Lord, are God. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, because you have prayed to me about Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard you. And so the writer of Kings goes on to describe that on the very same night, in answer to Hezekiah's prayer, an angel of the Lord came into the camp of the Assyrian army and killed 185,000 of their number. Now history records that Sennacherib returned home after this defeat and was himself assassinated by his own sons who wanted to save their father's crumbling empire. Isn't it interesting to note that Sennacherib faced a best case scenario. I mean, he had a stronger army, he was in a better position, he had more supplies, time was on his side, but he lost. And Hezekiah, on the other hand, faced a worst case scenario, poor strength, surrounded no allies, but he won, he survived. Now there are two main reasons why Hezekiah survived this worst case scenario, and I'd like to share those with you this morning as my lesson. These reasons are found in 2 Kings, again, chapter 18, beginning in verse one to seven, where we gain insight into the kind of man Hezekiah was. So you can turn over to chapter 18. We kind of go back and forth, 18 and 19 here. First of all, Hezekiah survived because he was a man who did what was right. Let's read 2 Kings chapter 18, verses one to four. It says, Now it came about in the third year of Hoshea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, became king. 
He was 25 years old when he became king and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem and his mother's name was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. He did right, oh man, stop there. He did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places and broke down the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah. He also broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for until those days the sons of Israel burned incense to it, and it was called Neshishtan. Don't you see it? Despite what his father did, Hezekiah chose not to follow in his father's footsteps, but rather chose to do what was right. You think that was popular, what he was doing? The religion and the practices that his people had been following for years and years, all of a sudden, he strikes all those down. I don't notice anywhere there that he had a meeting with some people. He didn't do a survey. He, he, he didn't have a meeting of his counselors. What do you think? We, we think? Is this politically expedient that we knock down, you know, we tear down the Asherah poles and we break down the altars of Baal and so you think we ought to do that? Maybe a go slow approach? I go back. He did what was right in the sight of who? In the sight of the person that it counts. In the sight of the Lord. He worked hard at undoing those things that were wrong in his country. Even those things instituted by his own father. When faced with the surrounding army, the temptation was great to give in to the terms of the pagan king. Surrender meant surrendering their faith, surrendering their history, surrendering their calling as God's people, and Hezekiah refused to do this. And so the worst case scenario often puts pressure on people to compromise what is right. Sometimes all we're looking at is the, is the worst case scenario and we don't see what's behind it. Why is this pressure being applied to me at this time of my life? And so what do we do? We compromise. We kill the unborn to save our pride, our convenience. I mean, soon there'll be pressure in this country to kill the elderly to save time and money. We say, oh, that could never happen. Really? There was a time in this country we wouldn't ever think there'd be a million abortions going on every year. And that's happening. There was a time in this country where the thought, the very thought that our president would support and encourage homosexuals to, to have marriage rights, the, the very thought of that would not even have crossed anyone's mind. And so the idea to you know, select the ones we need to, uh, you know, uh, to, to end their life expediently because you know, there's too much pressure on our system, cost too much money to take care of them. If you think that that's far-fetched, we're not far from that in the direction that we're going. We lower our standards because to maintain them would mean effort or self-sacrifice or the loss of our profit or the loss of advantage. Hezekiah did the right thing despite the cost and because of it he was saved. Remember, it's the prayer of a righteous man that availeth much, not the prayer of a compromiser or a negotiator. Secondly, Hezekiah survived because he trusted in God. I mean, you could write this lesson, really. You could write this lesson. There's nothing, there's no revelation here. This is not a revelation, this is a reminder. Hezekiah trusted God. Let's keep reading verses five to eight. He says, he trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that after him there was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor among those who were before him. What a compliment. Wouldn't you like God himself to say that about you? There was no one like Alan. There was no one like Bruce. There was no one like Jeannie. There was no one like Rhonda. There was no one, you know, there was no one like that person. Before or after. For why? He clung to the Lord. He did not depart from following Him, but kept His commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. 
And the Lord was with him. Wherever he went, he prospered. And he rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. He defeated the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory from watchtower to fortified city. Hezekiah understood that in order to survive anything, let alone the worst case scenario, he had to trust God. His reforms and changes brought him grief with the people. His refusal to bow down to Assyria alienated him from his allies. His stand against Sennacherib provoked the pagan king to the point where his entire nation would be destroyed. And yet in verse six it says, and I like this verb, he clung to the Lord like a child hangs on to a parent when they are afraid. His trust was complete, his trust was shameless. He trusted God to care for him for several reasons. Among them, first of all, he knew and believed in the power and the ability of God to save him. If God couldn't save him, who could save him? If God can't come through for you, who's going to come through for you? If you can't trust God, who are you going to trust? And he was doing right. He was obeying God's word and knew that when you obey your father, your father takes care of you. You can climb up into his lap and you can just hang on to him. You ever see a little child? They're playing, they're playing, they're playing. And then uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, thinking of our granddaughter, Lily. She's playing, she's playing, she's pre pretending she's jumping off a little stool. And we're all saying, that's wonderful. You're learning how to jump. You know? And then she jumped and went all crooked and started to cry. What happens? You know, daddy picks her up and she's hanging on to daddy. You, know, you can't even peel her away from daddy. Now she's crying because, well, I hurt myself and I need to go to daddy or I need to go to mommy. That word clung, amazing, isn't it? Clung, there's no pride in clung. There's no I'm cool in clung. Clung is I'm afraid, I'm beaten, I'm facing the worst case scenario and I'm clinging to you to help me. So many people cave in at the worst case scenario because they don't know God or because they do know God but they've been disobedient to Him and they have no trust because of this and that's one of the things that disobedience to God does. It, it dilutes your ability to trust Him. You see, Knowledge of God plus obedience to God equals confidence in God. You can't survive the worst case scenario without knowledge and obedience. Hezekiah was delivered because he knew God and he knew that God could do it and through his efforts at obeying God, he demonstrated his faith and his, and his trust. So in closing, let me, not, let me just say this about the worst case scenario in our lives today. A Couple of practical ideas. When it comes to the worst case scenario, remember, it rarely happens in the way you think it will. It rarely happens the way you think it's going to happen. The worst thing about the worst case scenario is the worry that people experience in thinking about it. The worst things that we imagine rarely happen to us. Secondly, when on the rare occasion that the worst case scenario does happen to us, we're never really ready for it anyways. No matter how much worry or planning, we're never quite ready for the bad news. We're never quite ready for the accident. We shouldn't be too hard on ourselves if we're in shock or if we don't react like we would like to react because we're rarely ready for it. And then finally, when the worst case scenario does happen, remember, continue to do what is right. Continue to do what is good. Continue what you believe the word of God is leading you to do because many times that worst case scenario pressure, its purpose is to move you from doing what is right. And Paul the Apostle says that God will not test you beyond what you can bear, not just physically and emotionally, but also morally. 
There's always a right way out if you look for it. And put your trust in God, even when all the evidence points the other way, God does love you, God does save you. you know, we don't have a lot of evidence out in the world. You know, does God love me? Man, there's war, there's cheating, there's injustice, there's violence, there's all kinds of bad things out there. But despite all that evidence, we believe that God does love us. We do believe that. And by save you, I mean that He will provide the help and the resources and the people and the strength and the whatever it takes to see you, to see you through. And so a question naturally arises from this, from this lesson. What's your worst case scenario? What does it look like? Is it a spouse who is ill or dying? Is it a child going bad? A daughter rebelling? Is it marital problems? Is it old age? Is it finances? Is it someone harming your child at school? I call upon you to put your worst case scenario before God in prayer and let Him save you from the anxiety and the worry, because a lot of times it doesn't happen. The thing that's killing you is the anxiety and the worry, and God can save you even from that. Learn to do right, learn to obey God, and let Him lead you through the worst case scenario. I want to tell you what the absolute worst case scenario is. It's not a dirty bomb. It's not somebody polluting our water system. Here's the absolute worst case scenario. The absolute worst case scenario is dying without Jesus Christ. That's dying without Christ and living eternally in hell without God. That's the worst case scenario. You can beat me up and take my money and shoot me, but I still have hope for life eternal with God, always. But the day that I lose that hope, nothing else matters. Nothing else can replace that hope. No matter what the situation in this life, this is the absolute worst case scenario. So I encourage you, avoid this scenario by coming to God in repentance and in baptism today in order to be saved from the absolute worst case scenario. And whatever your situation, God can make it better. If you need His help, if you need His forgiveness, if you need encouragement and strength to deal with difficult issues, our elders and ministers, our brothers and sisters are there to support you and encourage you. And so if you need the help of the church at this time, or help to avoid the worst case scenario, we encourage you now to come forward as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.